Who is this woman that you see on screen? Well, her name is Mariam Sonikiotis. She's been referred to as the most evil woman in human history, with her job being a full-time abbess, which is a name given to a leader of nuns. Mariam Solikiotis deceived, lied to, and manipulated everyone around her for many decades. Her two main reasons, money and power. But that was just scratching the surface of the evils she committed. By the end of her work, Miriam Solikiotis would be arrested and known as the nun serial killer, and for good reason. While it's not known exactly how many she murdered, it was at one stage claimed that she had killed 500 people. This is no horror movie. This is unfortunately as real life as it gets. Miriam Solikiotis was born around 1883 in Kerati, Greece, about 50.6 kilometers from Athens. Not much is known about her early life, but she worked in a factory before becoming an orthodox nun. Her birth name was Marina, and her childhood home was at number 71 Megaloo Alexandru Street. This home later became part of a monastery. Around 1900, Miriam became a Greek Orthodox nun. She was close to Bishop Matthews Karpathakis of Vestrena. When the Greek Orthodox Church adopted the new calendar in 1923, Miriam and Bishop Matthew, who then called himself Archbishop Matthew of Vestrena, followed the old calendar. This made them part of a group seen as separate from the main church. Outcasts, if you will. This was the beginning of what was to come. Known as Mother Miriam of Kerity, and Archbishop Matthew founded the Pangaea Monastery in 1927. It's located in East Attica, Greece. The monastery was set up to honor the Virgin Mary and to support the old calendarist movement. Archbishop Matthew was very clear about this financial goal of supporting the old calendarist movement. But by the time they founded the monastery, Matthew was already 66 years old. The monastery was planned for a few years. In 1925, Miriam bought more land for it. Even up till now, no one knows when, where, or how the nuns got the money for these purchases, and we may never know. The monastery's full Greek name means Monastery of the Entrance of the Most Holy Theotokos, the healer on the Pine Mountain. It was also a place for tuberculosis treatment because of its high altitude. In 1938, it became a free tuberculosis treatment center. The founding nuns, including Miriam Solikiotis, Irini Mandrinu, Maria Tsangari, and a few others. Miriam's official role as abbess, or leader of nuns, began in 1950, but she had been secretly leading since 1939. Archbishop Matthew, then 78, left the day-to-day -day operations to her. He was often in prison or practicing strict religious activities, which adds a strange element to the mix. Why would a 78-year-old archbishop in Greece be popping in and out of prison? Comment your thoughts. I mean, who knows? Archbishop Matthew himself might respond. Matthew's health declined rapidly during World War II, making him dependent more on Miriam. Some stories say that Miriam had a negative influence on him. For example, she reportedly stopped Archbishop Matthew from speaking to another bishop on his final deathbed. After Matthew's death, Miriam became the abbot of the monastery. She was known for wearing a special black nun's garment referred to by them as an Epinokali Mavkion. Clad in this black cloak, Mariam's plan was complete, and she was ready for what was to come. Her later years were extremely controversial. She encouraged rich women to join the convent, then forced them to give their fortunes to the monastery. Starting in 1940, she supposedly sent monks to find wealthy people to convert. By the time of her arrest, she had amassed 300 homes and farms across Greece, along with gold and jewels worth the equivalent to £72,904 in current money. One of her accusers, Eugenia Marghetti, said she was held in an isolation cell and tortured until she surrendered property worth US$80,000 in 1952, equivalent to about $881,604. In the rolling hills of Greece, the Panagia Monastery, under the control of Miriam Solikiotis, became a place of great controversy. Prosecutors accused Solikiotis of enforcing harsh religious practices that led to the tragic deaths of more than 150 people. These individuals, suffering from tuberculosis, sought treatment at the monastery, but were allegedly denied proper medical care. The only time doctors were reported to be on site was to certify deaths not to treat the infectious diseases. The horrors didn't end there. 
Survivors from the 1950s made serious accusations against Sola Kiotis, including torture, starvation, false imprisonment, and beatings. This alarming situation led to a significant police action on December 4, 1950. Over 85 officers, along with legal officials, raided the monastery. They removed 36 children, taking them from the nuns to orphanages. The police also found several malnourished and ill elderly women in terrible conditions, highlighting the poor quality of care and food given in the convent. Initially, the charges brought against Solakiotis were relatively minor, including illegal export of olive oil and import of tires. However, as more evidence of witness testimonies emerged, the charges against her grew more severe. In January 1951, all old calendarist sects, including Solakiotis's group, were banned in Greece. The following month, Solakiotis, along with 13 other nuns and monks, faced serious charges, including homicide, fraud, forgery of wills, blackmail, and torture. Solakiotis received the most severe indictment among them. During her trials, Solakiotis maintained a defiant appearance wearing an orthodox icon of the deceased Matthew, revered as Saint Matthew, the new confessor by some Greek old calendarists. Her defense, led by attorney Panos Panayotakos, argued that surrendering property to monasteries was common for people joining such religious communities. They contended that properties were in Solakiotis' name simply due to the lack of a legal entity for the monastery. But it was no use. The damage was done. Solakiotis was ultimately found guilty of seven murders, the victims included the Bakker family, who had joined the monastery and surrendered their property. Mrs. Bakker, confined in a tuberculosis-ridden cell, died shortly after being released. Mr. and Mrs. Panagiotopoulou died of starvation in the monastery. Miss Mikalaku, seeking treatment for tuberculosis, received no medical care and died locked in a cell. Sister Theodote and Sister Maria both died following beatings on Solakiotis's orders. As you can see, Miriam was a very godly nun not the god that usually comes to mind when hearing the word nun. She denied all charges until her death, dismissing them as satanic fictions. I wonder if she thought of herself as part of those satanic fictions as well. Nevertheless, she received three sentences over separate trials, with her final trial concluding just months before her death. She faced a total of 26 months, 10 years, and an additional four years in prison. Mariam had a significant following, described as a cult leader with over 400 followers living in the monastery at her peak. Records showed that 500 people willed all their property to the monastery and later died there, a number prosecutors found unusually high for a monastery of its size. Following her arrest in 1951, her followers protested, demanding her release, leading to heightened police security around key religious figures for fear of retaliation. Mariam Solakiotis, the controversial nun who led the Panagia Monastery, passed away on November 23, 1954, in Averof Prison. Different reports state her age differently, but it's generally believed that she was around 71 years old. After her death, she was buried in the convent grounds, close to Bishop Matthew Karpathakis, her predecessor. Even after her death, the monastery and her followers continued their activities, though the sect was officially outlawed. Police investigations as late as 1959 suggested that young girls were disappearing, believed to be connected to the Kerati convent. By 1961, the authorities were still puzzled about who had taken over from Mariam Solakiotis, as the new leader was never found. The monastery in Kerati still remains active to this day. Some members still believe in Solakiotis's innocence, seeing her as a saint. Old calendarism, the religious sect she followed, is no longer illegal in Greece. The country, as a member of the European Union, allows freedom of religion, and the sect's practices have become acceptable to Greek civil authorities. Solakiotis's legacy is complex and debated. Official records during her trial cited 27 direct murders and 150 indirect murders from tuberculosis negligence due to offering free tuberculosis treatment that only consisted of staying at her monastery's high-altitude location with zero medical help. Some authorities even claim she was responsible for over 500 deaths. However, as tuberculosis treatment was still new and widespread in Greece, the extent of her direct involvement in these negligent homicides is uncertain. Excluding these negligent homicides, the typical agreed-upon total of her victims is 27, including them 177. Some modern supporters, like priest Constantine Chorus, 
argue that Solokiotis was innocent and wrongly tried. The current nuns of the monastery, who were not witnesses to the event, still pray for Solokiotis, seeing her as a martyr. They believe that male bishops and monks, jealous of her wealth and power, falsely accused her, and they attribute the high death rates to the fact that many joining the monastery were already old. Will the world ever know the truth of what happened at the Panagia Monastery all those years ago? In popular culture, Solokiotis' case inspired two episodes of the Greek crime drama Anatomy of a Crime, although the show did not directly name her or the monastery. This illustrates the lasting impact of her story in Greek society and beyond. Wrapping up, we can learn two lessons from this true story. Number one is, what goes around comes around. If you harm others for your own selfish gain whilst using religion as an excuse, expect a visit from God. Whether it's the good God or something else entirely is not up to me. And number two, always seek medical attention from professionals. In this case, not doing so literally meant your death. Got your heart racing, didn't we? Hit that subscribe button and join us on this thrilling journey. And hey, drop a comment below if there's a comment that's been keeping you up at night. We might just turn the spotlight on it next.